Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. We were delighted to welcome Dr. Quigg to our clinical development program, Teach In, for a deep dive on toxic metal assessment and detoxification. Our CDP is one of a kind in the functional medicine world. An IFM educational partnership program, we invite clinicians of all stripes from around the globe to join us weekly in our live virtual rounds meetings, our teach-ins with functional medicine experts, to engage in dialogue with us in the greater CDP community, and to access our rich library of clinically relevant content. CDP, real-time functional medicine training for you, the practicing clinician. Now please enjoy Dr. Quigg's teach-in. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our CDP lecture series. I'm glad you could all join us today. My name is Karen Herb, and I am the professional education liaison for Dr. Kara Fitzgerald's education programs. I am happy and excited to be serving as your host today and quite honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Quigg, who will be presenting today about toxic metal assessment and detoxification an area for which he's researched and focused for many years. David Quigg received his master's degree in human nutrition from Virginia Tech and his PhD in nutritional biochemistry from the University of Illinois. He was then a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University for five years prior to serving as a senior cardiovascular pharmacologist with a major pharmaceutical company for seven years. Currently, Dr. Quigg is Vice President of Scientific Support for Doctors' Data. For the past 29 years, he's performed and published research pertaining to nutrition and chronic diseases, much of that work focusing on metal toxicity, methylation and metabolism, and detoxification. He regularly gives presentations at international and national medical conferences and has facilitated and co-authored a wide array of studies spanning exposure and retention of environmental toxicants, nutritional status, and dysbiosis. So it's truly an honor to have Dr. Quigg with us today. I'm going to go over just very briefly our agenda before we jump in. Uh, Dr. Quigg will be presenting for about an hour, uh, providing a review of foundational pros and cons of heavy metal testing, some terminology, and an overview of the clinically relevant pharmacology of the three primary chelating agents. We'll also be touching a bit on supporting the body's um, endogenous and upregulatable -regula metal detox processes. Uh, thereafter, we'll open up for uh, some Q&A and discussion. So I'd ask everyone, as usual, to remain muted during the presentation. And uh, feel free to utilize the chat box to type up questions as they come up. And when we move to that portion of our agenda, We'll go through the questions in the order they're entered and uh, cover as many as we can as time allows. So not to take up any more of that time with uh, procedural mumbo jumbo, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Dr. Quigg and thank you once again for, for being here and joining us today. Good morning and thank you so much, Karen, for that introduction. Uh, fellow Hokie uh, from Virginia Tech. So, <laughs> I, I would just uh, like to start by um, appreciating the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Remember, there is a P in that CDC and P. And I want to express my appreciation for their recent acknowledgement, and I quote, the epidemic of epidemics of cardiovascular, immunological, and neurological diseases are likely associated with environmental toxicants. And that's a huge, huge step forward for all of us. And toxic metals are certainly uh, still a major issue. And we are all, every one of us, are subjected to at least low-level exposure to metals from our food, water, and air. So today what I'd like to do is uh, focus on the clinical management of metal retention that may be associated with toxic effects. And I make a great distinction between toxic effects and metal toxicity. There is a huge difference and that'll come through. When we talk about chelation, we, we cannot neglect the uh, induction of our wonderful uh, inducible innate detoxification processes. And in some cases, um, just feeding that system alone is adequate. 
Um, and in other cases, uh, if one is going to use a chelator, it's absolutely essential to have that support uh, on board before you even start. So I'm gonna talk about um, testing for metals. I'm gonna talk about the specifics of provocation testing and clinical intervention with the pharmaceuticals after I address the very important component of helping the body help itself. So I like, I like to use quotes from uh, government bodies and some of my favorite are that um, low level exposures are associated with long-term effects that have not been previously recognized. That's from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And then of course, knowledge of adverse effects are based primarily on independent studies of a single toxicant, which isn't the real world. And then minimal risk levels for exposures have not considered in the past that humans bioaccumulate metals. It just blows my mind. Sponges accumulate metals, so why not humans? And also very importantly, metals can elicit not only independent and additive, but even, even synergistic toxic effects. And we see that in a publication that y'all should read. It's uh, from environmental health perspectives. And it's about um, effects of multiple metal interactions in children at environmental exposure levels. So again, we're not talking about frank acute metal toxicity. And this begins early in life. Now, it's very clear, and this is again from the CDC, that individuals vary considerably in their sensitivity to toxicants and susceptibility to the toxic effects varies with age, gender, pregnancy status, nutritional status, and very importantly, the total toxic load and your genetics. You can't change your genes, but there are things that we can do for the, uh, some of the single nucleotide polymorphisms. Now, we're talking about metals today, but again, the total toxic load, we have to keep in mind um, that metals can impair our, our biotransformation processes, um, particularly at the liver with the uh, cytochrome P450s because mercury, lead, cadmium, and other metals, and glyphosate can block cytochrome P450 activity. So right there, detoxification of chemicals can be a problem with the metals. But then we go to phase two where we have the activated xenobiotic. And again, uh, mercury, methylmercury, um, uh, arsenic, tin even, uh, and cobalt for those people with the metal on metal hips all impair the uh, phase two at the glutathione S transferase phase where we conjugate the metals um, to glutathione for excretion. So we have to keep in mind that there is tremendous overlap here. Now glutathione is not only important in phase two and as a wonderful antioxidant, but when we see these metals impacting glutathione levels. And if we look on the right here, the true transition metals like iron, copper, cobalt, and nickel invoke fenton or fenton-like reactions and reactive oxygen species, particularly nasty is the hydroxy radical. And then we have another uh, phenomena where metals like mercury, uh, it takes two glutathiones to bind mercury for its excretion in the urine and the bile. So both of these mechanisms, the oxidation and the direct tying up of the glutathione can lead to compromised glutathione status which can lead to endothelial dysfunction, vascular and neuroinflammation, oxidation of macromolecules, and especially important is the oxidative damage to DNA that we can measure as a 8-hydroxy-D-guanosine uh, in a first morning urine void. So comprehensive support for metal detoxification is actually quite simple. Um, and need not be overly done and expensive and elaborate. Um, we want to support antioxidant uh, capacity, both endogenous and exogenous, uh, and key uh, cofactors co for antioxidant enzymes uh, in the body are zinc, selenium, and magnesium. 
We also need to consider supporting the liver, the kidneys, uh, and the bowel, and I can't stress hydration enough. And so we support these intracellular innate detoxification processes to push the metals out. And in order to support those systems, we need to feed those inducible mechanisms um, so that everything can go right. If you don't feed it, it's not going to work well. Now, the key point here is that none of the three commonly used pharmaceutical chelators or bind, metal binding agents, they cannot appreciably cross into the cell and they especially cannot cross uh, a healthy blood brain barrier. So they are restricted to the blood compartment. I would be the first to tell you that after 22 years of working in this field, we really do need some better chelators. What we have work, um, but when you're restricted to the blood compartment, um, it can be futile unless you do the comprehensive nutritional support. So I like the analogy, we don't shovel snow with a pitchfork. It, it just doesn't work. Okay, so if we don't support endogenous detox, the efficacy of our chelators is much compromised. A key component of that endogenous detox system is the quintessential tripeptide glutathione with the sulfhydryl group on the cysteine moiety uh, being critical for several intracellular protective functions as well as extracellular. It's the most abundant intracellular uh, thiol at millimolar, it's micromolar in plasma. Um, it's important for antioxidant defense and redox control and for today's discussion, it's key for conjugating metals and chemicals, which we just saw the overlap there. So we're talking about the push and pull phenomena where these uh, endogenous mechanisms push the metals out of the cell. And for that, we use things like glutathione, glutathione S transferase, and very importantly, and often overlooked, phase three detoxification, which entails the membrane bound efflux pumps that help get these conjugated toxic toxins out of the body, and they would be the multi-drug resistance proteins and the organic anion transport proteins. So the chelators, once the metals are pushed out of the cell, will pull the metals from the blood. Now, how do we uh, work with trying to get glutathione levels high? We're all familiar by now with the fact that oral powdered encapsulated glutathione really doesn't cut it in a random design um, uh, placebo uh, controlled study of 40 adults at one of the naturopathic colleges, they found that giving um, uh, 1,000 milligrams of uh, powdered encapsulated glutathione a day uh, to 40 adults did absolutely nothing to affect the uh, oxidative uh, markers of oxidative stress, the 8-hydroxy-DG and the isoprostane. And there was no change in red blood cell glutathione or the ratio of oxidized to reduced glutathione in the plasma. So the oral encapsulated glutathione uh, doesn't work systemically. However, uh, if there is an issue with the gastrointestinal tract, um, it is good. The enterocytes will take up that glutathione and utilize it. But when we're trying to get systemic effects, we uh, need to go some other route, and that's where I always suggest to consider oral liposomal glutathione while trying to increase glutathione biosynthesis. Recall that a liposome is a phospholipid um, bilayer with a water core, and the glutathione is trapped in the core so that phospholipid vesicle can slip through uh, and has much greater bioavailability. Now, so the topic of increasing glutathione levels, um, we can use the immediate approach of oral liposomal glutathione that has been shown to increase glutathione in several tissues, including the brain and the heart, and it's also been shown to increase cobalt excretion and neuroprotective in vitro. Um, 
it increases plasma, reduced glutathione, cysteine, taurine, and essential sulfate ions that are so important for our mucous membrane barriers, the sulfation of the mucins. And that was a study of 13 autistic children. And we know that the liposomal glutathione is a thousand times more effective than even N-acetylcysteine in vitro, um, looking at macrophages and their ability to uh, oxidize or prevent the oxidation of uh, LDL. <clears throat> so what about intravenous glutathione? Um, a lot of people like to use intravenous glutathione, but I hate to tell you folks, it has a half-life of 14 minutes, and that was using two grams in uh, 10 adults. So for a quick cleanse, uh, a quick antioxidative burst, the IV is fine, but the liposomal makes more sense to me because you can take it on a regular basis. Now here's a comparison of different forms of glutathione um, on their efficacy to remove radio-labeled cobalt after a single uh, intravenous dose uh, in a rodent model. So they were zapped with cobalt-60, and then they were given one dose per day for five days of nothing, regular encapsulated glutathione, liposomal glutathione, or IV. And you can see that the liposomal glutathione at just one dose a day, and that's only about 400 uh, milligrams, was 75% as effective as the intravenous glutathione. The advantage being that you can take the uh, liposomal glutathione on a daily basis. And this is a really important slide with respect to your patients that still have those metal on metal uh, total hip uh, implants uh, where the cobalt is um, a really significant issue. And I did a little pilot study on a 57 year old female. Uh, she was 14 years with Lyme's disease, moderate lead and cadmium retention. And we did a baseline measure. Her glutathione was about 72% of normal, normal being greater than a thousand. A microgram per liter. And then she took just one teaspoon each morning, uh, two hours away from food of the liposomal glutathione. And you can see that after two weeks, it already started to increase in the red blood cells. And then after four months, it was increased by 128%. That is the RBC glutathione. So uh, this is an N of one. And this was with only one teaspoon, and typically it's recommended to do a teaspoon in the morning uh, and a teaspoon later in the day, importantly two hours away from food. So that's just the quick fix, but how do we increase glutathione biosynthesis? Let's help the body help itself. Number one is adequate dietary protein for the amino acids, particularly methionine, uh, and cysteine, which is most safely given as N-acetylcysteine. But whenever we're giving methionine, remember your plasma methylation and methionine metabolism. Uh, make sure you have adequate cofactors for appropriately metabolizing methionine on down through SAM, homocysteine, and back to methionine using <clears throat> magnesium, um, B12, B2, B3, uh, trimethyl, um, glycine and uh, a form of folate, a whole nother subject. Antioxidants, um, exogenous uh, mixed tocopherol, the vitamin E, vitamin C, and alpha lipoic acid serve two purposes. They spare glutathione from its antioxidant function uh, and also help regenerate the oxidized glutathione back to reduce glutathione. And so a key here is to not only provide the rate limiting amino acid in the form of N-acetylcysteine, but also to regulate the rate limiting enzyme, upregulate the rate limiting enzyme. So we start with increasing the availability uh, of cysteine, of course have magnesium and potassium for every ATP dependent process. And then we want to stimulate the gene expression of the rate-limiting enzyme, gamma-glutamyl cysteine ligase. 
So it's a two-pronged approach, the substrate, and let's jack up the gene expression of the rate-limiting enzyme. So how do we upgrade the rate-limiting enzyme? Um, well, there's some nice um, botanicals, um, curcumin, quercetin, which is basically onion extract, have been shown to increase glutathione levels by stimulating the transcription and activity of GCL, the rate-limiting enzyme. Oleanolic acid has been used in China for a long, long time. Um, it maintains hepatic glutathione. Um, and right now, I don't know of anybody that has oleanolic acid, but I've been told that uh, people are working on a more water-soluble, higher bioavailable form. And then we have sulforaphane, and sulforaphane is derived from our brassica vegetables, our broccoli in particular, where in the uh, substrate uh, in the plant, glucoraphanin, by the catalytic activity of morosinase is converted to sulforaphane. And um, that is a really slick system because the glucoraphanin is compartmentalized uh, separately than the enzyme. And once the broccoli is munched on, let's say by a deer, it activates the, the reaction by combining the moros uh, morosinase with the glucoraphanin. Sulforaphane is, uh, sulforaphane is uh, very unstable. Um, one, and you got to be careful with products out there. There are a lot of products that say they're sulforaphane and they actually contain about 3%. And I'll talk more about um, a better source of that. What we do at home is um, we do two crops a week of our own broccoli sprouts and daikon radish sprouts. And the daikon radish sprouts are very uh, enriched with the morosinase enzyme. So when we take our broccoli sprouts, which are 50 times more concentrated than the adult broccoli trees, as I called them when I was a kid, um, you can create your own sulforaphane from salads and sandwiches. So the key is to induce that rate limiting, the gene expression of that rate limiting enzyme. And if you haven't seen this paper in, uh, regarding autistic children and um, sulforaphane, you really need to read it. It's had tremendous um, uh, effects on improving different uh, comorbidities in those children, um, which are notoriously very low in glutathione. Um, and so what they are basically talking about here is that sulforaphane and other botanicals have an, a hormetic effect to activate the stress proteome via the NERF2 antioxidant, rea uh, antioxidant uh, reaction uh, entity uh, that activates gene expression of basically all things glutathione and cytoprotective. Uh, also SOD, uh, the phase three efflux pump, and the um, cytosolic proteins, the metallothionines. Now, the only uh, product that I know of that has um, basically uh, as much sulforaphane as possible was patented by one of the authors from Johns Hopkins University. And um, I'm not sure whether any of the supplement companies are carrying it at this point. I think there is one, but I can assume only that it's very expensive. But don't get duped by these products that say they're sulforaphane uh, when in fact they're only 3%. Also for endogenous detoxification, we have to have uh, nice functioning methionine metabolism, particularly methylation, because for something like arsenic, the endogenous detoxification entails sequential oxidation and reduction and methylation reactions, where we convert the original inorganic arsenic to monomethyl, which is really nasty, further oxidize it, and then to dimethyl arsenic and then conjugate it to glutathione. And studies have clearly shown that uh, we absolutely have to have our s methionine, our SAM, uh, as a methyl donor, and arsenite methyltransferase. So we wanna be paying attention to our methylation capacity. 
And it's been shown that low methionine, uh, folate, and cysteine all impede arsenic detoxification. So another system to feed and take care of. Now on to testing. Let's start with um, the basic model of toxicology, which dictates that we first have to have exposure, assimilation, whether it's oral uh, or through the lungs, uh, some degree of retention before we can talk about toxicity. But very importantly, we can't jump from a test of exposure to make a conclusion of, or diagnosis about toxicity. Now for exposure, we have several ma uh, biological matrices, uh, including hair. And hair uh, is an excretory tissue. Uh, it binds circulating metals and it concentrates metals cumulatively, cumulatively without reverse transport back into the body. Once the metals are incorporated into the protein growing in the hair, they're cataloged and can provide us with a little forensic record. And hair methylmercury uh, concentrations are about two to 300 times greater than the blood mercury levels. So hair is very useful for recent or ongoing exposure up to four months in the past. Um, it cannot be used to diagnose metal toxicity and it doesn't provide a direct indication of net retention. Now hair analysis for particularly methylmercury from fish has been endorsed by the CDC and the World Health Organization for screening women of childbearing years because the maternal methylmercury is highly correlated with adverse developmental effects on the fetus and children readily transferred across the placenta. In fact, it's been quoted um, from the Mayo Medical Laboratories that the concentration of mercury in hair correlates with the severity of clinical symptoms. And several nationally recognized labs, not just this crazy cam labs out there, um, have been offering hair analysis specifically for mercury, lead, and arsenic for many years. Now another biological matrix for looking for exposure would be whole blood, which shows recent or ongoing exposure. Uh, whole blood uh, lead is the standard of care regarding potential issues with lead exposure and especially toxicity. You can never say that a patient has lead toxicity based on a provoked urine or even unprovoked unprov urine. The standard of care for bona fide toxicity is the level of lead in blood. But again, it provides no indication of net retention. Now, blood has uh, some problems as acknowledged by our friends at the CDC and uh, to quote them, the concentration of uh, lead in blood reflects mainly the exposure history of the previous few months, half-life of 27 days with a single exposure, and does not reflect the larger burden of the much slower elimination kinetics of lead in bone. And recall that bone lead in adults uh, constitutes 95% of total body lead. And that blood lead or that lead in the bones rebounds, uh, re-equilibrates with soft tissue levels of lead after each uh, bout of chelation. So about a two week period for re-equilibration from that vast bone lead store. Again, no indication of blood uh, metals um, with respect to net retention. So let's talk about net retention. Um, metal toxicity, or what used to be called poisoning, has been long accepted and it's acknowledged that it requires medical intervention. We can talk about some of the craziness of what's considered to be medical intervention. Uh, first is logically remove the source of exposure, but then the focus is on treating the uh, concomitant um, uh, anemia. Okay, and that's not gonna do a whole lot for brain function. 
And in fact, chelation is only recommended in adults if repeat blood lead levels are greater than 45 milligram per deciliter or greater than 25 milligram per deciliter in children, even though the CDC acknowledges that there is no safe level of blood lead in children. Now, the bioaccumulation, or more commonly referred to as the body burden of metals, is acknowledged by the CDC, um, but the American College of Medical Toxicology, not metal, says that chelation is useless and even dangerous, and I could talk for hours about their uh, faults there. The reality is, for a given individual, the toxic effects Again, I'm not saying toxicity, but the toxic effects are elicited when the level of retention exceeds physiological tolerance. And the presentation there, person walking into the clinic, uh, you can't just say, ah, looks like you have lead toxicity or toxic effects of lead or mercury because the symptoms are so vague and multiple. Now, to support the uh, use of uh, provocation, the provocation protocol, um, I've cited some major organizations, um, including the Mayo Medical Labs. I really like some of the stuff that they write. Um, they state that measurement of urine lead before and after chelation has been used as an indicator of significant lead exposure, and I would add retention or body burden. And Dr. Goyer from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences has stated years ago that there's a nonlinear relationship between blood lead and post-DMSA or calcium disodium uh, EDTA uh, urine lead. And that's because with a linear increase, linear increase in blood lead, there is an exponential increase in the post-DMSA or post-EDTA urine lead. So scratching at the surface, looking at the blood. Also, elevated urinary lead chelate complexes resulting from what was known as the EDTA lead mobilization test back in the 50s uh, provides a good means to assess body burden. And also, just look at the package insert from calcium EDTA, the lead mobilization test is also mentioned there. Now, this is one of my favorite slides and where I really have a problem with the American College of Medical Toxicology. This was a fantastic study that was published by, by the late Dr. Apotion uh, many years ago where uh, the subjects, the dental techs, dentists, or controls were given 300 milligrams of DMPS uh, orally, and then urine was collected for six hours. And we can see in the pre-DMPS uh, specimens, there was a significant difference related to exposure. The techs doing the dirty work had higher levels and certainly higher levels than the civilians. But look what happened after DMPS, over a hundred times increase in uh, urine mercury output into dental, in the dental techs, less so in the dentists, but also even in the controls who were bearing dental amalgams. So seeing this data, the A person from the American College of Medical Toxicology says, this test is useless because urine mercury excretion increases in everybody after a, chel a chelation challenge. Really, there's no difference between going up to 400 versus 27. So there's a real problem there. Yes, it does go up in just about everybody, but the question is how much does it go up? And I dealt with a case uh, not too long ago. It was a 27-year-old uh, male uh, immigrant from India. He had a, his first visit with a cam doc for persistent major acne. It was revealed that he was previously treated with Ayurvedic herbs in India, and the doc did a DMPS provocation, and his urine mercury was, post-DMPS, was over 5,000 micrograms per gram. We tested the Ayurvedic bulk herbs that he was using, and they were also loaded with mercury. So it's a matter of the extent of increase after DMPS. 
So the actual provocation process, um, the pre, it's always a good idea to take a first morning urine void um, or when a urine specimen, when the patient comes into the clinic and that's your baseline level of what's um, exposure, ongoing current exposure and what the body is able to excrete. Then we have the post urine collection, uh, have the patient empty the bladder, take the chelating agent, and then collect all urine for six hours. Now that gives us two objective numbers, the pre and the post. And using those objective numbers, you are allowed to use your professional opinion and to estimate the bioaccumulation of net retention. And I emphasize estimate. And the urine metal should always be expressed per gram creatinine. We're doing a timed collection uh, so that we're not uh, confounding the issue with differences in urine volume. So not just a concentration of the metals, but expressing per internal standard of creatinine. Now, the pre-specimen, a lot of docs um, say, oh, I don't do the pre's, I, you know, I just, because you don't see anything there. But I've seen too many docs get burnt by inner, uh, organic arsenic. Or, in, organic arsenic species are uh, cleared very rapidly from the body with a half-life of about 48 hours. And they're very abundant in shellfish, things like arsenobetane, uh, arsenocholine. So do prevent alarmism, do that pre, and have the patients abstain from fish and shellfish for a week prior to doing a provocation challenge. Um, do the pre and post your analysis initially. And here's a classic example. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. These are the test results for an unprovoked first morning urine where the patient didn't comply with avoiding shrimp and shellfish. In fact, she had shrimp scampi the night before. I've seen this with the all-you-can-eat shrimp fest and the arsenic level, level of nearly 2,000 micrograms per gram is probably 90% that rather um, harmless uh, uh, methylated forms, uh, naturally occurring forms of uh, organic arsenic. And I've seen cases where docs said, oh, I don't do pre's. They get a result like this after DMSA or DMPS and assume that it's net retention. And they unnecessarily put the patients through an expensive and extensive uh, chelation treatment. Then after about 10 weeks, when they do a follow-up provocation and there's no arsenic there, they cheer and say, hey, look what we did. We got rid of all that arsenic. I said, you didn't do anything. You didn't know that that arsenic was coming from what the person had to eat the night before, that organic arsenic. So do use care there. So prior to provocation testing, it's a really good idea to get informed consent and that should and the varies um, state by state. So you definitely would want to consult with your attorney about that. Absolutely assess glomerular filtration. Um, not only do you want to avoid an acute renal failure um, because we are sending the metals to the kidneys, but also it's a continuous variable. And by that, I mean that you can follow EGFR uh, in your patients over the course of chelation. And many times we see that uh, glomerular filtration actually improve because the metals do accumulate uh, in the kidneys and are nephrotoxic. Uh, blood chemistries, just to make sure that there isn't any kind of liver damage, uh, liver enzymes, BUN, and it's not a bad idea to get a blood lead because even if uh, you tell a patient that their post-DMSA urine lead is um, disturbing to you um, and could be associated with some of their symptoms, if they go down the street and go to their GP and tell them, um, you know, Dr. Fitzgerald said I have lead toxicity. She never said that. In fact, if you have that blood lead uh, value on hand, you can respond and say, I would have never said that because look at the level of lead in blood, which is the standard of care. Obviously, patients should be well hydrated before the provocation. Ketchup hydration doesn't work very well. And avoid supplemental zinc. 
uh, and selenium uh, 24 hours before the provocation. There are definitely uh, limitations, inherent limitations in provocation testing. As I alluded to, the agents are restricted to the blood compartment and we're relying on a concentration gradient and the help of the body to push the metals out. Calcium uh, disodium EDTA, DMSA, and DMPS do not appreciably cross into cells nor a healthy blood-brain barrier. Uh, provocations do not directly reflect the element retention and therefore in the central nervous system. But in the older animal studies, they found a high correlation between what was coming out in the urine uh, and other, the concentration of the metals in other tissues. And that's because when we give a chelating agent, it provides a really good flush of the metals from the kidneys and that level in the kidneys is highly correlated with other tissues. There was a wonderful summary and um, opinion piece written by Dr. Um, Joe Pizzorno. I'm sure you're all familiar with him. And this reference down here in the blue, you really need to read it. Just such a logical explanation about the validity of provocations and how he views them. And basically that the only other option is to do uh, biopsies all over the body and try to figure out uh, net retention of metals that way. So the provocation test does have limitations, but it's the best that we have. Now, I mentioned uh, several times that the agents are restricted to the uh, blood compartment. But years ago at Doctors Data, um, Dr. John Pangborn came up with a protocol um, using what we call the glycine shuttle or assisting agent. And that's 40 milligrams uh, per kilogram of the simple amino acid glycine orally, mix it with water, uh, slug it down about two hours before a challenge. And what happens is the glycine, the natural amino acid, uh, has the ability to go in and out of cells um, very simply, uh, and also has a surprisingly sufficient affinity for metals like even mercury and lead. So the glycine goes in, picks up um, some lead or mercury, brings it back out into the um, blood compartment where the chelator, which has a higher affinity for the metal than the glycine, can take the metal from the glycine. So this effectively increases the uh, chelating volume of distribution, if you, if you will. Um, it should always be used in conjunction, that is glycine, with a chelator. It should not be used alone because it could just ping pong the metals from cell to cell and even have, uh, facilitate their movement into the central nervous system. Contraindications, so this would be about four and a half grams of glycine, which is ever so slightly sweet. Uh, it's really easy to drink in a glass of water. Contraindications, um, acute, obviously if someone has hyperammonemia, uh, you don't want to dump in a bunch of any amino acid, but chronically it should not be used and should not even be considered as a sole metal detoxification agent, um, not only because of the ping pong effect, but also because as we're all aware, glycine can ultimately, ultimately be metabolized to oxalic acid and cause problems there. Now, I do agree with the American College of Medical Toxicology in their statement that scientifically acceptable normal reference values for post-provocation urine metal testing have not been established. I agree uh, with that. It's absolutely true, nor they should be. And we've already talked about the individual variability in susceptibility to toxic effects. So it's just coming up with a population statistic for post-provocation metal level, a single metal level, um, really is not appropriate to apply to a patient, especially when it doesn't take into account the excretion of the other metals that can have additive and even synergistic toxic effects. So when we do our provocation testing, um, we always compare the post, say in this case DMSA, to the pre-level in the urine. 
So the pre-level of uh, lead was only 0.4, not significant ongoing exposure, but a significant indication of net retention, and we don't use the unprovoked reference range. Same thing with mercury. Some exposure, uh, not very high, um, but after provocation. So uh, quite a significant increase. So compare the pre and the post results and apply your clinical judgment. Now interpretation of provocation tests is where some people get into trouble. Like I said, we never conclude metal toxicity from the results of a provocation test. And due to the limit, inherent limitations, uh, yes, the test is valid when done correctly, but it serves as a component of your diagnostic judgment. In other words, you consider the test results uh, along with, in the context of the amounts of all metals excreted, uh, the physical exam, symptoms, complete occupational and environmental exposure history, what if the person worked in a field and was exposed to uh, insecticides and herbicides or, or chemicals. Um, so the total toxic load is critical. Um, and again, one cannot diagnose metal toxicity against unprovoked uh, urine reference values. Now, provocation testing is also a very uh, useful monitoring tool to evaluate the efficacy of your clinical intervention with a chelator. And it's been stated by two of the big national labs that urine lead analysis is useful for monitoring chelation. Um, and very, very importantly, follow-up provocations need to be done identically to the initial um, provocation tests upon which you made your judgment to proceed forward, either with a comprehensive nutritional support or with a combined uh, comprehensive um, chelation protocol. And when I say identically, I mean identically. The same agent, the same dose, the same route of administration, and the same collection time. We have to compare apples to apples. Now, the FDA status of the agents, uh, calcium disodium EDTA has been around for a long time, since the 50s. It was the only uh, pharmaceutical for lead poisoning in children. And that's, of course, calcium disodium versinate. And it's the only form of EDTA that is indicated for metal decorporation. The disodium EDTA um, is only uh, indicated for digitalis toxicity or extreme hypercalcemia. So it's the calcium disodium EDTA um, that is, actually has an FDA indication for metal detoxification. DMPS uh, has been used extensively in Germany and China for many, many years. It is not FDA approved. It is available from compounding pharmacies with a prescription for a specific patient. And note that it is 2,3-dimer capto compound. So it has those two juicy sulfhydryl groups, um, as does glutathione especially since it's not FDA approved, it's a really good idea to get informed consent when using DMPS. Uh, FDA, uh, the uh, DMSA came along as the oral hero because the only thing uh, prior to that for children with lead poisoning was the intravenous or IM uh, EDTA, Cal EDTA. So DMSA was fast track approved as an orphan drug about 1990, tested extensively in three and four-year-old children. There is a brief comment in the physician's desk reference about the potential efficacy for other metals. We see not only mercury, arsenic, um, tin, antimony, and a variety of metals. And again, uh, they've really cracked down on the compounding pharmacies. It can only be obtained by prescription for a specific patient. The days of getting a big bottle of DMSA and handing it out to patients are behind us. So the clinical pharmacology, uh, DMSA is only available in oral form and it's only absorbed at about 20 to 25%. The peak plasma 
uh, and peak urinary excretion rates of DMSA are three and four hours respectively. That way, that's why we can get away with a six hour collection. The in, is excreted in the urine 90% as a mixed disulfides with cysteine. So again, we have to have adequate cysteine. Um, potential side effects, the most common loose stools, bloating, fatigue, uh, sort of feel like you're getting a flu. Um, some people nausea and um, occasionally a rash and then rarely increased liver enzymes, leukopenia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. So do periodically do your CBC and liver enzymes uh, when using DMSA. Now there's a problem with um, sulfhydryl containing compounds uh, in a dysbiotic gut. Uh, things like N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, and DMSA exacerbate GI symptoms. And in autistic children, not only their, their terrible GI symptoms, but also the aberrant behavior, the stimming and the head banging, et cetera. And bacteria and yeast um, facilitate this exacerbation. Um, urease positive bacteria such as Citrobacter frundi uh, produce hydrogen sulfide and ammonia from uh, NAC and methionine. So if your patients are taking the Pepto-Bismol or admit that to you or say they have GI issues, assess their GI health and integrity clean up that gut before you even think about dropping in either any of the, the um, salt hydro containing um, uh, molecules, uh, NAC or DMSA. Now, because of this issue in autistic children, years ago, Dr. Uh, Usman and I did a little pilot study where we bypassed the gut and used DMSA suppositories at 20 milligrams per kilogram and with a six hour uh, urine collection. And these were three and four year old um, children on the spectrum. And much to my surprise, I was wrong. As you can see, the pre-urine uh, uh, lead levels are in the uh, stripe bars and the post and the solid, there was a substantial increase in lead excretion, um, particularly for this child up to 40, it was around 47, uh, uh, micrograms per gram creatinine. And this was really powerful to me because your best data is the data that does not support your hypothesis. I said it wasn't gonna work, it certainly worked. Also for mercury um, in these autistic children, there was a substantial increase after DMSA, after the DMSA suppositories, these are the same children, but note the difference in the magnitude of the excretion of the metals. We were up at uh, 40 some, um, yeah, up to 50, uh, near 50 with the lead and only a max of about five uh, with the mercury. So we do see a lot more lead than mercury, even in children on the spectrum. The DMSA provocation, um, definitely hydrated patient, uh, 10 to 30 milligrams DMSA uh, as an oral bolus dose, uh, not to exceed two grams uh, on an empty stomach. Uh, withhold food for about two hours, you'll have maximum absorption of the DMSA. Encourage about a half a liter of fluid over the next um, few hours and collect all urine for six hours. Um, calcium disodium EDTA uh, only works intravenously. Um, historically, it was given as a slow drip or IM in children, um, but now we've had the introduction of the uh, Cal EDTA fast push or, or slow push and fast drip. Um, recommended 50 milligram per kilogram, not to exceed three grams. To be honest with you, most docs are using half that dose now. There are so many binding sites in a gram and a half of EDTA that the classic three gram dose is really not going to show much anything more. So the slow push is about five, over a period of about five to 10 minutes and many docs will uh, dilute that uh, Cal EDTA uh, about 50-50 
or you can do a uh, fast drip of about 100 cc's um, over a 30 minute period. The half-life of calcium disodium EDTA is only about 45 minutes, so clearly a six hour urine collection. And never, ever, ever push or fast drip the disodium EDTA. Um, first of all, it's not indicated for metal detoxification. We've seen wonderful results from the TAC-1 uh, trial and the TAC-2 trial with diabetics is coming up. Um, however, if you push or um, drip too fast the disodium EDTA, you will suck the calcium out of your patients and there have been uh, at least three cases of um, cardiac arrest and death associated with a too fast, more than a gram per hour of the disodium EDTA. Uh, metal detoxification with DMSA, um, it's a two week cycle, three days on. Um, I am a very firm believer in starting low and titrating up. So 250 milligrams three times a day. If they tolerate that well, you can go up to 500 um, and 11 days off. Remember, we have that two week um, re-equilibration time for lead to come from bone back to soft tissue. Many clinicians report of minimizing side effects of DMSA by giving plenty of magnesium that will not interfere with the um, metal detoxification um, by the DMSA and rechallenge after about five to 10 uh, of those two week cycles. We don't want anybody on any drug any longer than they need to be do consider looking at their basic blood chemistries over the course of time. Again, your liver enzymes, um, serum creatinine, which is a moving variable. We should see that improve in people that have it compromised to begin with, and liver enzymes. So the essentials of chelation, uh, absolutely assess glomerular filtration, cover your butt, cover your patient's butt. The last thing you need is an acute renal shutdown. If there are GI symptoms, take care of it. Do an objective comprehensive stool analysis and intervene appropriately. Assess and optimize nutritional status. That is with amino acids. You can check RB, your red blood cell elements, RBC glutathione, um, and absolutely check for ongoing exposure. Um, remember the first rule of toxicology is to remove the exposure. If your patient uh, has exposure going on and you continue to chelate, it's like a, a new puppy chasing his tail in the corner, eventually he's just gonna fall down. Establish your net retention uh, using your pre and post initially. And remember, this is not a race and one size does not fit all. Provide adequate antioxidant support, encourage fluid consumption and fiber, keep the bowels moving regularly, and do monitor the efficacy of your individualized protocols. In other words, do your um, re-challenge after about five to 10 cycles. And very importantly, um, chart changes in symptoms because Remember, you're not treating a lab test. <clears throat> you're not just looking for, okay, the levels of metals went down, you're fine. You want to concomitantly associate any change in symptoms with the decrease in the uh, estimate of metal burden. So take home thoughts, um, use the basic principles of toxicology in a modern preventive context, remove the source of exposure, apply toxicokinetic and pharmacokinetic facts, clean up the gut and optimize nutritional status before you even begin to think about thinking about using a pharmaceutical chelator. And do remember that DMSA uh, is not a nutritional supplement, it is an FDA approved drug. So I've given you these and I will make available a PDF of this slide deck because I know you won't remember all this stuff, but this is just the stability constants for EDTA. And stability constants basically mean it's uh, the, uh, the relative affinity and it's on a log scale. So the higher the number, the greater the ability of the EDTA to bind and 
Uh, gadolinium is a really hot subject right now. EDTA is the agent of choice for gadolinium retention. And you can see that as we go down here, uh, we get to cobalt as we have in our metal on metal hip patients, um, uh, having an extremely high affinity with EDTA. Now these are stability constants are derived from strictly in vitro test tube studies where there is uh, controlled temperature, osmolarity, pH, and only one metal. So we have to keep in mind that in the body, it's very different. We have um, the actual removal of the metals is a combination of the specific affinity of the chelator for a metal, uh, mass competition with other metals. So if we have um, a whole lot of lead and a tiny amount of gadolinium, there's mass competition at similar uh, binding constants is going to favor pulling the lead more before pulling uh, the bulk of the gadolinium. Also in vivo, we have significant binding of metals to endogenous ligands. For example, the binding of mercury to the sulfhydryl group on a uh, free cysteine uh, is 10 to the 44th, way higher than the affinity of any of the agents. Now we don't have uh, available uh, binding uh, constants for DMSA, sorry to say, um, but we do have stability constants provided by the Hyaltec Corporation, the manufacturers of DMPS, um, um, expressed as a, um, as a monomer or as a dimer because DMPS can form dimers in circulation and the dimers have a slightly higher affinity for the metals than do the monomers. But the reality is, clinical reality is, DMPS is great for uh, mercury, uh, methylmercury, inorganic mercury, um, and um, uh, lead. So here's the, the, the real take home summary. And this is based on my 22 years of experience of looking at thousands and thousands of these tests as well as published literature, your first choice, your metal and your first choice. Um, and what I really like about DMSA is that it really excels for both mercury and lead, whereas EDTA really um, doesn't touch mercury. And, um, and um, let's see, the other two um, that I really want to point out are uh, cadmium, which is a bear, and gadolinium, EDTA, is really the only agent um, of choice. And then we get down to things like uranium, where I'm constantly asked about uranium and high barium. Um, there are no, there's nothing that we have available to um, eliminate or enhance the uh, excretion. And then finally, a very timely subject is thallium. We're seeing more thallium uh, in the laboratory than ever before. And that's quite a story in and of itself. None of these uh, traditional triad, the three uh, uh, most commonly used chelators touch thallium effectively. And the only available agent that acts as a gut binding resin, it's an anion exchange resin, is called Prussian blue or radiogardase. And that is basically the only way to get rid of the extremely, extremely neurotoxic thallium. So that's, uh, I hope that I've uh, enlightened you. It's a huge topic to cover and I probably raised a whole lot more questions than answers. So I think we do have some time for questions, Karen. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, it was such a, a wealth of information. Um, I'm glad we have some time here. Um, Stacy, I see that your um, first question came up a little bit later in the presentation. Would you like to unmute and talk further about um, your issue or your question? Oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, Dr. Quigg, you were mentioning sulfur later as um, sulfur agents may be irritating patients with uh, dysbiosis. But there are also patients that have sulfur overload or sulfur sensitivity. And 
the up ramping of the um, phase one and phase two, you were saying to give, you know, glutathione or NAC, sulforaphane, grass to vegetables. So what would you do in that kind of patient? Would you just give some molybdenum or? or um, you're, you're going past uh, dysbiosis and going to say an issue with uh, uh, converting sulfite to sulfate. Yes. Yeah, and some of the patients get all backed up, you know, they did right, they, they right. sensitive to any extra sulfur at that point, garlic, you know, right. and then one we, sprig of broccoli. <laughs> right, and you know, and we have this new wonderful, relatively new tool of looking at SNPs, and we can look for SNPs in the sulfite oxidase um, enzyme, the SUOX, and even if one has an, a SNP in SUOX where it would impair or cause for a, a sluggish conversion of sulfate to sulfate, we can push the envelope um, clinically by providing uh, molybdenum, which is an obligatory cofactor for not only um, sulfate oxidase, but also xanthine oxidase. So yes, giving sulfur, um, and um, it's interesting that um, DMSA is a, the sulfur isn't released from DMSA and it really shouldn't be getting into the uh, sulfite, uh, sulfur pathway, but um, there are definitely people that just have issues with it. Um, DMSA is not for everyone. Um, people have tried. Uh, giving extra molybdenum, and anecdotally, they say it seems to help, but a lot of people just can't take the dithiol containing compounds. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see our other questions. Um, looks like Myra wanted to clarify that um, you, you would suggest really to be thorough testing hair, blood, and the urine pre and post provocation to get a full picture of, uh, of that. Is that no, accurate? No, not at all. Um, the hair, blood, hair, blood, and unprovoked urine are simply going to tell you about exposure, which is a critical component to know about before going into either nutritional or chelation detoxification. Um, and among those uh, matrices for identifying exposure, hair has the longest window of time, about one to four months if you cut the hair within an inch of the scalp. The half-life of the almonds in the blood is shorter, um, but it is the standard of care, so that might be influence your choice whether to use hair and or blood. Um, if you use hair and blood, you have that longer window of time plus the more current uh, in the blood. Um, and then um, your indication of net retention, of course, is the pre and post provocation. Um, so I, I don't recommend doing all three tests, but at least one, uh, one, one matrix that will show you exposure. Uh, ongoing uh, or recent. Now, remember with hair, if a gentleman or a patient was, uh, you know, a, a three pack a day camel smoker and 20 years ago and hasn't smoked since, you're not going to see that lead and cadmium and antimony show up in the hair. Um, but identifying exposure. And um, that's really more to guide you with respect to what you need to do clinically um, before you start your detoxification program. The first rule of toxicology is to remove the source of exposure. So not every test for every patient, but you know, it's, it's your clinical decision of which uh, test of exposure um, to use. Um, a lot of people just do the pre and post because the pre-urine will tell you ongoing or very recent exposure um, and just get it all done in one day. Excellent, thank you for, for that clarification. It looks like Dr. Fitzgerald has our next question. Are Hello. you able to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Buck, buckle up. Um, 
David, thanks. I, that was the, what I caught was great. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I, I thought it was later than it was. So I, I'm really bumming, but I can just listen to the recording. Um, okay, so I have a handful of questions for you. Did you, um, you know, the second half-life of lead in somebody who's got bone loss? I mean, are you, what yes. are you recommending around that? Uh, the postmenopausal. The gift that uh, never stops giving. Yeah, exactly. Um, once the estrogen levels drop, the osteoblast activity goes down and we get accelerated uh, turnover of the bone minerals. And that's where 95% of our lead is stored. Probably four times a week, I'll get a call. Um, a doc is working with a uh, peri or postmenopausal women woman, uh, say doing DMSA, um, initially the um, post DMSA urine lead dropped from say 50 to 25 and it's stuck there mm -hmm. because that's where we have that re-equilibration going on. Clearly we're never going to get all the lead out of bone and it wouldn't make sense to keep pounding away every two weeks on with a you know with a two uh, three day on cycle of DMSA. So I spoke to um, my fellow faculty members at ACAM that do the uh, chelation training and kind of forced them to come to a consensus on this. What do we do about um, this persistent lead issue? And I really think it has something to do with the um, fact that uh, postmenopausally uh, women have really caught up with men with respect to cardiovascular disease. I do think that lead is a significant factor there. So the things to consider would be um, just your obvious, um, do they have adequate vitamin D, K2? Um, are they doing light weight bearing exercises? Um, and then periodic, say maybe once a month, um, you know, use your clinical judgment, do a round of DMSA to try to clean up that soft tissue lead that the bone has been constantly pre pre presenting. I once did a literature search on uh, menopause and lead, and there were over a thousand peer reviewed papers. Mm. Only one of them addressed, hmm, there might be something that we could do about this. And so half of the uh, postmenopausal women got just calcium, which as you know, isn't gonna do diddly. And the other half, uh, and it was a large study, got um, calcium plus low dose bioidentical hormone replacement. And they did a DEXA scan, I think it was their tibias before and after the treatments. And sure enough, at the after I think it was nine months, the women that were on the low dose bioidentical hormone treatment, um, the uh, DEXA scan indicated that they retained more of the lead in bone. Well, that actually doesn't sound really great, but it's better than having it out in soft tissue. And of course, with any uh, hormone replacement therapy, you have to consider um, the family history and uh, of estrogen responsive cancers. Um, so yeah, the bottom line is you don't just keep pounding away with the MSA uh, in that um, category of patients because it's you're ultimately just going to develop problems. Yeah, I would imagine you could expedite bone loss, you know, because the lead is hanging out in bone and you're pulling more and more. I, I agree that inhibiting bone turnover is makes sense right um the other i would you know i was just curious about when you were showing those binding affinities for edta mm -hmm. whether or not with cobalt being so strong would you be paying attention to b12 status as well um no actually um i always pay attention to b12 status and i don't do that with serum b12 but rather the urinary mma yeah um because um if you just look at b12 it doesn't tell you whether it's oxidized or not and as you know from all your your uh, speaking about methylation that mtr that methionine synthesis methionine synthase requires uh, reduced uh, 
um, B12, that is the cobalt moiety needs to be reduced. And when we're looking at um, the excretion of metals in the urine, um, we will see elevated cobalt in somebody who's taking, uh, they're doing B12 injections or a lot of sublingual. And that's, and that's because the ICPMS uh, process of analyzing for the metals uh, passes the, uh, the metals through an 8,000 degree vector. And yeah. so anything organic is burned off. So a person that's consuming uh, or taking in a lot of B12 will have an apparent high level of urinary cobalt. And so you have to ask that question. Um, number one is, do you have a metal on metal hip implant? Um, and number two, are you, are you taking a lot of B12? Because that cobalt could be very misleading there. But you're not worried about EDTA actually minimizing cobalt available? Oh, absolutely yeah. not. That, okay, okay. That, that cobalt in the B12 is tied up where the EDTA can't. Isn't going to do anything? Okay. No, All right. I'm curious, since I, I missed your comments on hair analysis, did you talk about what metals are reliable in hair? Actually, um, due to the sake of time, I cut out um, a slide and it was a classic example. Pretty much um, all of the toxic metals um, will show up in hair because hair is an excretory tissue and things that are in circulation will bathe the hair follicle and get incorporated into the protein. The sample report I had was, oh, just horrifying there. And it was actually a doc who let their two-year-old tease on uh, NICAD batteries. Oh God, and no. The really? hair analysis looked identical to the composition of the metals in the NICOD battery. Yeah, the, the clinician was way beside himself and just, what was I thinking? So um, it's a general screen. Um, it tells you nothing about net retention, but I have seen it pick up virtually every toxic metal. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, just curious about cesium and then i want to there's other mess the other questions coming up so i don't want to like dominate your time but cesium is another element that's showing up more and more and i know unless it's radioactive it's less of a big deal i just do you have any comments around that what you're seeing and yes um what we report we don't report any of the um the high energy radioactive uh, isotopes of things um like cesium or thallium uh, or thorium um, where we report the isotope that is naturally occurring and along with thallium we are also seeing uh, concomitantly in the same patient a lot of cesium. Yeah. And uh, the thallium is particularly problematic um, as an extremely, probably one of the most neurotoxic metals, I've hor absolutely horrifying cases of that. Um, but the other issue with thallium and cesium is that they interfere, they're both monovalent cations, and so they interfere with potassium metabolism, mm. which as you know is kind of important everywhere, yeah. um, cardiac, neurological. Um, and I think that okay. where we're seeing the source of a lot of this uh, thallium and cesium is from the frac water waste brine where pulling thallium and cesium from you know 70,000 feet below the surface, bringing it uh, to the surface as the uh, frac water brine is expelled back up and it has gotten in and contaminated our water and our crops. Okay. 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 So then actually that was, was what I was thinking around too. So supporting potassium and high potassium foods, et cetera. And yeah, yeah, and if you do see, if you do see a high cesium uh, and or thallium, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to just look in an electrolyte panel and mm -hmm. just see um, if that potassium antagonism is, is significantly disrupted. Not only have I seen it, I've, I've seen it, I actually blogged about a case a while ago because it was extremely refractory, I mean, it was just hanging out in this individual for um, 
you know, months and months and months, despite my best efforts. And, and so that, what was based on what test? It was urine. Okay. It was, urine. Yeah, it was urine. So, so that was most likely continued ongoing exposure if it was, yeah. if it was urine. Um, and, you know, again, back to the first rule of toxicology, try to figure out where that's coming from. Um, higher mm -hmm. levels of cesium have been found in milk now because there is, uh, it, apparently it's getting into the pastures um, and into the water. Um, and, um, but the issue with thallium, if there are neurological symptoms, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess around with just trying to compete it with potassium. That's never going to work. Um, if there's significant neurological symptoms, number one is to, unfortunately, it's a nutritionist nightmare, is to tell them to back off on the kale, the brassica vegetables. We've even uh, found it in cabbage, um, spinach, and you just hate to tell people to use okay. moderation in the consumption of these wonderful foods. Um, but kale in particular is extremely efficient at taking up thallium. In fact, in one of my presentations about thallium, the, um, the article that I cited was from the Journal of Soil Remediation because they actually go in and plant kale where they know the soil contains a lot of thallium. The question is, what do they do with that kale afterwards? Um, so it's 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 kind of a nightmare, which is why uh, we have switched from you know broccoli th three or four times a week to uh, cultivating our own broccoli sprouts, organic broccoli sprouts uh, in the kitchen. Yeah, and those sprouts are fifty times more concentrated in those uh, wonderful um, compounds um, than is the adult broccoli. Um. Yeah, you know, I've had some patients actually talk to their, you know, that when if they're a part of a CSA or they're buying at their farmer's market. I mean, those folks do get their soil tested. <laughs> if yeah. you, so you could you could actually probably ask the farmer. But, yeah, yeah. And, and, and most don't have that information. Um, and the other issue is, um, I mean, you take a, a state like Ohio where there's really no fracking to my knowledge, but... Ohio was accepting money to take the frack water waste brine from the state of Pennsylvania. And I even saw this picture oh. of a tanker truck in the winter uh, riding around spraying this frack water waste brine on the icy highway. So it's getting everywhere. Yeah. Uh, even uh, one patient had. Um, a very high um, urine thallium and in fact most of the cases that I see that have high thallium are people that are juicing and she was in fact consuming a half of a bag of uh, organic spinach every morning and uh, we analyzed the spinach and sure enough even though it said organic um, you know it was loaded with thallium so you have to be really really careful it's such a shame, you know, whenever we have these detox lectures, we all get all hangdog by the end. It's depressing. It's horrible. <laughs> God. Um, all right. Let me just pass over. Mary Lee has a question for you. Actually, I'll just read it to you. Can, or, can you see the chat? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. How do you use the mineral component of the DDI hair analysis? The essential minerals, I'm assuming. She's talking um, very carefully. There is um, far and few between peer-reviewed publications to support the clinical utility of the essential elements in hair. There are certain elements that I definitely rely on. Um, for example, with magnesium, if I see it very high in the hair, uh, first question is, are they over supplementing or is it due to magnesium wasting, which yeah. we see in like vegans and vegetarians who aren't getting enough taurine, which is critical for helping cells hang on to magnesium. Um, also uh, selenium, uh, chromium, um, but a lot of the other essential elements, I think that it should be used as a clue 
that there, it, you know, it may be high or low, and then a follow-up test, a more direct test of either whole blood or packed red cells for the essential elements is going to give you a more accurate picture. So back in the day, you know, Sid Baker used to recommend his magnesium challenge to see if somebody's yes. wasting, yes. Yes. right? With some, with a bolus of IV magne magnesium. Uh, and I actually, what, they, what it was used for was um, sort of like the iodine load test where they would do a baseline um, magnesium in the urine 24 hour. And then after giving a very um, controlled IV dose of magnesium, seeing how much is excreted. And if less than 90% of that dose was excreted, the conclusion was that there was um, a need for magnesium and it was being retained by the body. Um, um, but you could also look at it the other way. Um, if it's you know 100% excretion, it's kind of hard to say whether it's wasting or that the patient is just perfectly adequate with respect to magnesium. So, I mean, it would be nice. I mean, I think I see a magnesium wasting phenomena sometimes. I mean, would you say that hair could be reliable if you see a bunch of magnesium in hair? I mean, I haven't used a hair analysis in years and years and years, but yeah, it could absolutely. be a useful tool. Absolutely. And I have followed up on cases just for educational purposes and gone ahead and compared in that same patient the, the very high hair magnesium to um, serum, whole blood, and uh, RBC magnesium. And while the hair magnesium was very high, the, and the serum and whole blood looked relatively normal, the RBC magnesium was pegged low. Same thing with zinc. Um, so absolutely, it's a clue about magnesium wasting, but of course, first you wanna ask about, um, you know, how much magnesium are they taking? Are they just overloading the system and the right. hair is an excretory tissue? Right, that's also a handy pearl, you know, that maybe they need taurine. Exactly. And the, the other thing is there is one pattern um, that I look for, and that's when you have uh, calcium and magnesium uh, deviated uh, in one direction and sodium and potassium impaired deviated in the opposite direction. And that has been come through just clinical feedback and hooking it up with uh, looking at a cortisol, the cortisol data, um, an indication, uh, what, it's what we call the um, stress pattern. So when you have paired magnesium and calcium in one direction, sodium, potassium in the other, first question you ask about is stress. I've seen, I've seen people go from, they do a, a hair analysis every year and things look peachy mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the young woman goes through a nasty divorce and bang you see that stress pattern come out that uh, clues you in that maybe you ought to be looking at salivary cortisol profile that's interesting you know Richard used to always talk about that too and I was yes. like yeah 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 <laughs> <I> didn't, like, <laughs> no <laughs> it's real every time I see it and I ask the clinician they just say oh good lord this guy he works 80 hours a week and or he lost his job and this and that and it's just yeah it's it's real and the, and so the pattern is elevated Mag elevated sodium and potassium. What is the pattern again? Say it. Um, it's a divergent pairing, and that's why on our particular hair uh, report, we put um, calcium and magnesium at the top, and then right underneath of that is sodium and potassium, so that you can see the cal mag um, high uh, in um, on one side, and then right underneath the sodium and potassium say low. So it just jumps out and hits you in the face. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, all right. So you you agree with Dr. Lord? That's Absolutely. good. That's, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's great. That's actually that's all right. I'll I'll let him know when I talk to him. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, He's a good old boy. He is. He is, and he did. He would talk about that pattern with us, you know, quite a bit, and we could never find anything on it in the literature. No, there really but, isn't. Um, many, many years ago, um, Jeff Bland tried to do a study related to that, but um, 
he was measuring urinary um, a metabolite um, instead of just looking at say salivary cortisol which would have been a much better index and he did not wasn't able to support that stress through the the um, analyte that he was measuring in the urine um, but if you look at the cortisol the four or five point cortisol profile um, you'll probably see it there okay all right well that's that's good that's actually a, a, a couple of really nice pearls for bringing the hair analysis back into into our clinic mm -hmm. anything else you guys i guess it looks like we're we're over. I'll let Karen jump in. Thanks, David. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's been really wonderful. We are we are a little bit over time, so we'll uh, wrap it up. And I know that um, I'll be able to circulate the slides, so I'll uh, get that out to everyone. And uh, so many clinical pearls. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Craig, for for being here today and presenting. It's, it was really wonderful. Oh, you're very welcome. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, well, take care for now, everyone.